literally overnight, her body was covered with huge blisters. I think the biggest one was probably three inches in diameter. No one wanted to be around her because they were afraid that it would spread to them. I didn't even know what to think. I tried not to be frightened of it. My legs locked up on me. I couldn't walk. She stiffened. It was as if she was being electrocuted. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. When Katie Faust wakes up with a few seemingly ordinary bug bites, she doesn't give them much thought. Little does anyone realize, they're just the first signs of a potentially deadly disease. These are ER doctors. They had never seen anything like that before. I had huge blisters on my arms and on my legs. I was really scared at this point. Then, Angela Smith's life is brought to a terrifying standstill when she's faced with a series of debilitating attacks that no doctor can explain. I was really scared because I really knew there was something wrong. My legs just were paralyzing. As a child growing up with three siblings in the suburb of Columbia, Maryland, there was no doubt that Katie Faust was the star of her family. Katie was probably the most active of the children. She was very healthy. She was very confident and outgoing and independent. She always had everyone around her entertained. You were never bored when Katie was around, that's for sure. I had a lot of friends. I played sports. I never stopped talking. <laughs> Popular and at the top of her class, Katie graduated from high school in June of 2004 and then took a semester off to plan her college career. I wanted to eventually own a restaurant, so I thought business management would be the perfect track for me. She was going to start spring semester 2005. I was excited because all of my friends had already gone away to school, so pretty much I wanted nothing more than to live on my own. Katie needed to get a physical to go away to college, just a routine matter. And part of the exam was a test for TB to live in the dormitory. They prick your arm and then circle the area where they pricked. And if any redness or swelling happens, then it's a positive test. Two days later, it didn't look right. And I couldn't imagine how that would happen. When I went to the doctor, she saw redness and swelling and they sent me to go get my chest x-rayed. They didn't tell me anything initially, which made me worried. For a while, I thought I had tuberculosis because my test was positive. The doctor let me know that the x-rays were clear and that I didn't have tuberculosis. They gave me a clean bill of health to live in the dorms. They weren't really worried about why the test came up as a false positive. If they didn't think that it was a big deal, then I didn't either. I was excited to start school. Confident that she's healthy, Katie and her family head down to Florida to spend the holidays with her grandmother. We used to go down there for Christmas every year, and I was really excited to be with my family. We'd go and walk around the lake and just sit outside. I think I was down there for about four days before I noticed the bug bites. They were extremely itchy. She just couldn't stand it. So I gave her some antihistamine to control the symptoms. They got so itchy that I woke up one morning and I had scratched them open and they were bleeding. I didn't know what to think about that. It seemed pretty extreme. It strikes Katie as odd that her siblings don't seem to have any bites. But it isn't long before she begins to notice something even more peculiar about the sores themselves. They started to expand outward and into a rash, and then they had started to grow blisters around the perimeter. I didn't know what was going on. So I wanted her to make an appointment and go back and see the doctor. I went to my pediatrician, and when she looked at it, because of the itching and the redness and the blisters, she thought that it might be a staph infection. Staph infections are caused by Staphylococcus bacteria, a germ commonly found on the skin. But if staph bacteria enters the bloodstream, it can lead to sepsis, a potentially lethal condition in which the body is literally overwhelmed by the infection. My doctor prescribed antibiotics 
and then I moved to college a few days later. It was about a two-hour drive from home. It's always a nerve-wracking feeling to send your child off to school and you're not going to be there, but in this case, it was even more so. I was looking forward to meeting new friends, getting the regular college freshman experience, living in the dorms and things like that. Katie finds college life just as exciting as she had imagined and quickly becomes friends with another girl in her dorm, Stephanie Dietz. I noticed the spots when Katie first moved into the dorm. I knew she was being treated for a staph infection, so I was not concerned at all. We did everything together. We went to the commons to eat. We studied together, and we lived a floor apart. But while Katie's adjusting to her new life, she's also beginning to wonder if there could be something seriously wrong with her. I was on the strong antibiotic that should have been taking care of things. And after the 10 days, I actually noticed that things had gotten worse. The blisters were increasing in number and in size. I feel like one day we woke up and it was just everywhere. I saw full, big blisters growing on myself. It was pretty gross. They looked like oversized blisters that you would get like on your feet. But instead of being like white in color, they were like all red with like a thin membrane over top. The areas that didn't have a blister had an itchy rash. I had around 15 to 20 blisters now. I would wake up in the middle of the night because the blister was broken. I would probably wake up around three to four times during the night because I would roll over onto a wet spot in my sheets. Katie had a lot of trouble with sleeping because she would wake up in a pool of her own pus. If they would pop when she tossed and turned in the middle of the night, she would soil her sheets and soil her clothing. So it was never like she could go to sleep comfortably without the thought that she might be interrupted by, you know, a wet spot on her sheet or having to get up and change her clothes or shower in the middle of the night. I kind of figured it wasn't a staph infection at all. I knew that I had to go back home and go to the doctor. I felt bad for making my parents drive all the way out to come and get me. I was really worried about what was going on. She looked exhausted. She wasn't sleeping. I, I didn't even know what to think. It was pretty gross. I tried not to be frightened. The doctor didn't know what to tell me. She thought that it might have been eczema presenting in a strange way. My best friend growing up had had eczema and there was no blisters. So for my doctor to tell me that I had eczema just really confused me. But Katie's doctor isn't overly concerned and sends the 18-year-old back to school with a topical ointment she believes will do the trick. I used the ointment for about a week, even though I didn't think I had eczema because I had no other option. and noticed that things were still getting worse. I think I probably had over 50 blisters. I felt like I was starting to lose control. It didn't seem to be getting any better at all. We were really worried for Katie. We didn't know what was going on. Katie Faust could have never imagined her first two weeks of college would be so devastating. Since the 18-year-old arrived on campus, strange blisters have begun to develop and spread throughout her entire body. I think mentally this was really hard for Katie. Freshman year of college is hard for anyone, but the fact that she had to deal with this as well, it made her definitely, you know, down. I wasn't doing as well in school as I had hoped because my mind just, you know, was focused on what was wrong with me. Overwhelmed and frustrated, Katie does her best to live with the bizarre blisters, but they soon become impossible to ignore. One day, I put on a pair of pants, and the pants were fine when I put them on, but when I moved, my pants would pull tighter. That's when blisters would break. I would end up with little wet spots on my pants from where the fluid was leaking out. I started just wearing loose-fitting clothes, like sweatpants and sweatshirts all the time so that I wasn't walking around with these wet spots everywhere. It was making me self-conscious. I felt like I was missing out on the normal college experience. Other kids that I knew were going out and meeting new people, just things that I felt like I couldn't do 
I think she did a great job of hiding it because it was winter, so you could wear long sleeves and long pants and it wouldn't be abnormal to be wearing those. I kind of turned inward because I wasn't as confident as I had normally been. We called her every couple of days just to see how she was doing. I think that she was trying not to tell us the full extent because she doesn't want to worry us. I think the biggest difference between us and her parents is that her parents were just getting the updates over the phone and we physically saw it and we saw how bad it got and how quickly it got bad. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a gradual thing. I don't think I led them to believe that I was as nervous as I really was. I wanted to handle the problem independently. I wanted to feel like, you know, I was 18 years old and I didn't need my parents for everything anymore. But while the blistering continues to escalate in severity, nothing could have prepared Katie for the horrifying course her condition is about to take. One day I woke up and one of my blisters was just absolutely huge. The biggest one was probably three inches in diameter. And I had showed Stephanie because at this point I was very freaked out about it. It was like literally overnight her body was covered with huge blisters and scabs from blisters that had already popped. They were yellow in color mostly and then the scabs were just all red and pretty gruesome. I think we were fearing a lot of things at this point. We didn't know if it was life-threatening. We didn't know if it was going to get worse. We didn't have any answers, so it was time for Katie to go seek more medical attention. When I went to the hospital, one of the physicians came in to look at my skin, and they had never seen anything like that before, which made me a lot more nervous because these are ER doctors. Like, you expect that they have seen everything, and here I was, and they didn't know what to do. They told me they were just going to treat my immediate symptoms, and they gave me a prescription pain reliever. You know, doctors are supposed to be able to tell you what's wrong, and she still didn't have any answers. At first, I was too scared to go to the hospital because they were going to diagnose me, and now I was even more scared because they couldn't diagnose me. Frightened and embarrassed by the state her skin is in, Katie works out an elaborate routine to help keep the disfiguring blisters hidden from her dorm mates. When I came out of the shower, typically I would try to go to my room fast before anyone kind of caught a glimpse of me. But one morning when I came out of the shower, the door was open at the end of the hallway. I kind of wasn't expecting it. I realized that someone had seen me. I went into my room quickly and just tried not to make eye contact. Little does Katie know just how public her secret is about to become. The RA for the floor had come to talk to me and she let me know that someone had informed health services that I had some type of skin lesions and wanted to know what they were from and what it was all about. She, she was upset and no one wanted to be around her so it was hard. There was definitely gossip going on. Some people didn't want her in their rooms or sitting on their things because they were afraid that it would spread to them. Katie's arms and legs were just plastered with wounds from old blisters and new blisters all over. I was worried that health services would try to remove me from the dorm. I was really scared. I knew something strange was going on. In order to stay in the dorms, I had to go to the student health services at my college to get checked out by the physicians there. I was really scared at this point. I had huge blisters on my arms and on my legs. The rash was pretty much covering my skin in the areas that the blisters weren't present. All of the doctors that were working that day came in to look at me. They were very freaked out. They had no idea what was wrong with me. So they sent me to a local dermatologist, Dr. Sims, and fit me in as an emergency appointment. When I first met Katie, she was understandably anxious. I told her the progression of things. What was interesting about it was the number of blisters that she had. And she had lots of patches of pink inflamed skin. Mostly these were on her arms and her legs. 
and sometimes the blisters actually form a very symmetrical pattern that suggests that this is something coming from the inside of the body. The most important test was to do a biopsy, so I biopsied a tiny blister on her thigh. When she did that, I was extremely hopeful because no one had made a step like that before. You know, they were actually testing my skin. It takes usually about six to seven days to get a biopsy report back. At first, Katie is determined to get through the long wait by herself. But after a few days, the uncertainty becomes unbearable. She called us at, at the point where she was getting panicked. My fears were that she had something really bad and that we should probably have her drop out of school and come back home. At that point, I talked to Katie's mom. She was very anxious about her daughter being several hours from home and her not being able to be there. It was tough waiting for the results, but at the same time, I was afraid that it would have been some disease that there wasn't a cure for. After an anxious week, the lab report finally arrives on Dr. Sem's desk. And it doesn't take long for her to zero in on the source of Katie's problem. What really clinched the diagnosis in Katie's case was a test that showed that there were antibodies were on the roof of the blister. With all that information, the only diagnosis that she could have would be bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid is an autoimmune disorder of the skin. In a healthy individual, antibodies help guard the body against infections and foreign substances. But in patients like Katie, for some unknown reason, they attack the tissue that joins the top and middle layers of the skin, weakening and separating them. The result is severe inflammation and blistering. The epidermis, or our top layer of skin, is attached to our dermis, the second layer of skin, by something called the basement membrane. The basement membrane is basically the place where the glue is that holds the epidermis onto the dermis. And that uh, glue is what gets attacked in bullous pemphigoid. So as the antibodies attach to that area, they cause inflammation to occur. Surprisingly, what Katie thought was the initial symptom, her rash from the TB test, had nothing to do with the condition at all. When Katie's rash first started, she just had the TB skin test done on her forearm, and I think it was somewhat coincidental. In fact, the first signs of the disease were the red raised marks that Katie thought were insect bites. When bullous pemphigoid lesions first start, they're often just pink, swollen, itchy areas, and they can look like a bug bite. So there's often quite a bit of itching because of the inflammation. And as the inflammation gradually increased, it was only a matter of time before blisters started to form. When there's inflammation, there's swelling. That swelling is caused by fluid coming to the area. There's increased blood flow to that area, and that increased blood flow basically causes leakage of fluid uh, into the tissues. It causes so much inflammation and swelling that enough fluid collects underneath the skin to, to force the skin up and into a blister. I felt great to finally have an answer because I could start getting better, could start getting my normal life back. But despite her relief to finally have a diagnosis, Katie can't help but wonder why so many other doctors were unable to identify the disease. If you take 100 patients with blisters, 99% of them are going to not, not have bullous pemphigoid at least. The majority of people who get bullous pemphigoid are very old. It's not a really common disease. I think I probably see a patient a year maybe with bullous pemphigoid, but about 90% of them are over 80 years old. How did this happen to an 18-year-old girl? There's no known trigger to this and why it manifested in her at such a young age, we really don't know. We don't know what causes bullous pemphigoid. All of the autoimmune blistering disorders are caused by antibodies that the body develops, but we don't know what it is that first starts the body to make those antibodies. Katie may never know what triggered the disease, but now she and her doctor have more pressing concerns. How to deal with it. The worst case scenario for bullous pemphigoid is when you get more than 80 or 90% of the body surface area affected. And the biggest problem there is open sores can be at risk for infection, so that those things can actually be quite dangerous and even life-threatening. Katie desperately needed a solution. She needed to start to get better. After enduring painful and disfiguring blisters for two months straight, Katie Faust has just learned that she's suffering from a rare autoimmune disease that can be deadly. It just, it made me scared, but at this point I was just ready to start a treatment plan. 
While there is no cure for the disease, it can be treated. The first thing we did was to put her on oral steroids. These usually work great to suppress the antibody that's triggering the disease. I just really wanted to know how long I was going to have to live like this. I wanted things to go back to normal so badly. She actually got quite quick relief so that blisters started to heal and blisters stopped forming over a week or so. The goal usually over time is to taper down the dose. Many times as we taper, therapy will hit a point where all of a sudden blisters will start to form again and we'll have to up the dose again. So many times we'll add on another medication to suppress the immune system that then allows us to get to lower doses of the steroids over time. The combination of the immunosuppressant and the steroid eventually got rid of everything altogether. Katie was able to get off of her medications at 14 months after we diagnosed her. But while the treatment is successful, Katie will have to remain on guard for the rest of her life. It is possible for her to have some um, recurrences here and there. You really don't know if she's going to have recurrence until you see a blister. Bullous pemphigoid is a chronic condition, so I will have to deal with flare-ups for the rest of my life. But nothing will be as bad as the first time because they know what it is now and because they know the medicine that works for me. Today, Katie is healthy and on track to fulfill her dream of running her own restaurant one day. Last December, I graduated from college with my Bachelor of Science degree in business management. I am currently working at a fine dining restaurant in Columbia, Maryland. Katie is great now. She is 100% back to herself, 110%. The diagnosis has definitely taught me not to take my good health for granted. I didn't understand how it couldn't leave scars, but it didn't. She has great skin now. She's got a great life ahead of her, and she's off to a great start. I'm just thankful for having confidence again. I'm no longer worried about what people think of me. I have my life back. While Katie Faust searched desperately for answers to her mysterious condition, Angela Badgley simply tried as best she could to live with her symptoms until the dangerous disease began to spiral out of control. In 1977, 12-year-old Angela Badgley was enjoying a seemingly ordinary childhood in an Indianapolis suburb. Although her mother, Evelyn, a music teacher, was raising Angela and her sister by herself, the Badgley household was without a doubt a happy one. I was a very active child. I rode my bike all the time. I was always outside playing with my friends and my sister. She's always been a sweetheart. Angela worked hard. She was a big help to me because it was not easy with just me and the two girls. Everything seemed to be, you know, pretty normal life. But soon after Angela turns 12, she comes down with a strange sore throat. Although the doctor prescribes a round of antibiotics, it just won't go away. Angie had been sick for a couple weeks. She was under doctor's care for strep throat. She kept getting worse and worse. She was losing weight, and I called the doctor on a Friday and told him she was worse. Could he please see her again? And he says, just tell her to tough it out till Monday. But the very next day, things take an even more shocking turn. I was vomiting all night long. I was begging her at 12 to take me to the hospital, which isn't normal <laughs> for a kid to do. Finally, I think I passed out because I don't remember any, anything from that point on. I had to pick her up and carry her to the emergency room at the hospital. Right away, they took one look at her and wheeled her off. I woke up and I was in the emergency room and there were doctors all around me. Over the next hour, the medical team runs a battery of tests on everything from Angela's blood pressure to her blood sugar levels. And her blood sugar was in the 900s, supposed to be around 100. That was a nightmare. And they told my mom I had type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, once called juvenile diabetes, is a disease in which a child's body can't make the insulin it needs to turn sugars into energy. As a result, the amount of sugar in the blood skyrockets. Treatment is critical to keeping patients alive and well. We had to go to classes to learn how to take care of her, how to feed her, how to do shots, the whole thing. I was still a very active kid and very healthy. 
she was always very brave. Life is not always fair. This happens. But she's tough. She handled it. You know, I kind of came to grips with it and accepted that. In fact, Angela copes so well with diabetes, it isn't long before she becomes inspired to help others. And by the time she graduates from high school, her career path is clear. I went to nursing school for four years and became an RN. Nursing is Angela's sole passion. That is until the summer of 1990 when she meets stockbroker David Smith. My sister kind of blindsided me one day. She says, hey, you know, I, I know this girl that you really get along with, and we just got along great together. And neither one of us has dated anyone since then. We got married a little over a year later. David and I got married um, August the 3rd, 1991. After being married about a year, I started, you know, just having these feelings like I really wanted to try to have a child. And so I got pregnant through the pregnancy. I, I was fine. And on a beautiful Easter Sunday in 1993, Angela and David welcome a daughter into their family. Sarah was just perfect. We were very happy. I just couldn't believe it. I, I just wanted to hold her. As Sarah grows into a preschooler, Angela balances motherhood and nursing with ease. But then... One morning in the winter of 1996, she begins to notice a strange sensation in her lower back. It was like a gradual thing where I started having back pains. Kind of what felt like little minor back spasms, but I just thought, you know, I, I had hurt my back at work. I knew that one of her duties was to assist her patients. She'd have to lift them up to go to the restroom or roll them over to change the sheets. At first, Angela dismisses the pains, but over the next three months, the spasms steadily escalate. As her back pain got worse and she started to really have trouble bending over, I would have to help her get ready in the morning. David would sometimes have to put my shoes on me because I couldn't do it. I tried some over-the-counter pain relievers, but nothing even touched the pain, nothing helped at all. And I was starting to have some worries that something might be wrong, but I just kept thinking, I'll get better. It'll go away. In fact, Angela is confident that if she strengthens her back muscles, she'll feel like her old self. And that March, David gives her a bicycle for her birthday. I just really thought I was out of shape because I had always worked out and, you know, after having a baby I really wanted to get back into shape her bike I thought was a wonderful idea but she just couldn't do it I'd have to hold on to the seat kind of run with her a little bit and get her started once I got started I could go for a little while but then I couldn't stop it was weird because I got on the bike and I had no balance I kept falling I, I couldn't ride the bike I couldn't stop the bike and I just fell into the grass and it wasn't until she fell in the grass that that was you know the sign that you know it's just not going to happen i thought okay we need to stop my first thought when i when i couldn't ride the bike was that you know i'm, I'm just really out of shape totally just totally out of shape it was shocking but yet i i still thought i was out of shape and i didn't want to worry about anything else over the next six months, Angela does her best to simply live with the spasms and pain, which seem to kick in at random. But one afternoon in October, without any warning, her ordinary life turns into a living nightmare. My mom was a teacher, and the school that she worked at, they always had a Halloween parade. And Sarah wanted to be in it. It was kind of a cool day. I was just walking along with my mom and we were just talking and the kids they were just marching along and all of a sudden my back i just felt something just oh, i can't even describe it it hurt like crazy she grabbed on to me and i kind of caught her and lowered her to the street and we couldn't get her up that was the eye opener this was the first time where i was really scared because I really knew there was something wrong. My legs just were paralyzed. I didn't really want Sarah to see me like that. It was scary. I couldn't move. It took maybe a half an hour before I could actually get up and walk again. It was very frightening to me, and I was embarrassed. I called 
my primary doctor, and he referred me to an orthopedic specialist, and he ordered a CAT scan. The CAT scan came back negative. I kind of felt weird about it because I knew something was wrong. I thought they were just doing a CAT scan just so the doctors could say, well, we can't find anything, so it's just a bad back. And he just dismissed me and said it probably had hurt my back at work. The orthopedic doctor had given me prescriptions for pain medicine, but that didn't help at all. I decided maybe I just needed some rest. I thought that might really help. But over the next two weeks, the agonizing attacks don't let up. In fact, they get worse. When Angie had a back spasm, it was as if she was being electrocuted. She'd stiffen like her whole nervous system just was alive, like a wire. She just had no control. And just when she thinks she can't take it anymore, an alarming new symptom begins to emerge. My knees didn't bend like they should. It was like all of my joints were just so tight. It was a struggle just to walk. Sarah used to make the joke that she looked like Frankenstein because she was just walking without bending her knees. It got increasingly hard to take care of my daughter, Sarah. I couldn't even lift my own daughter. We thought that when Angie rested her back for a couple weeks that this would be helpful, but it, it didn't do anything. After the end of the two weeks, I was worse than I was at the beginning. I just tried to just keep thinking that it would get better. I was trying to be strong. I just kept working until it got to the point at work where I was really having trouble walking and doing my job. So I talked to my manager, and she said that I could be charge nurse. That was more of a desk job. I would help the other nurses out, and I would go around and do all their blood sugar checks for them. It helped having a cart to hold on to with my walking and pain and everything. The rest of the time, I was at the nurse's station in a chair. I knew that for her, it was humiliating for anybody to see her like this. So it was great that she was charge nurse. She wouldn't have to deal with, you know, lifting patients, and she could heal. But just a few days after starting her new job, Angela suffers her worst attack yet. It just hits you like a ton of bricks. And it really almost makes it hard to breathe until it, it lets up. There was a nurse nearby, and I said, help, help. Other nurses came in. They got a wheelchair and kind of scooped me into the wheelchair. I remember just being really scared. This was the first time where I really couldn't walk for a long period of time. It had been well over an hour before I took a couple of steps. So I called David and I also called my primary doctor and he referred me to a neurologist. She called me from work and told me that I needed to come get her now. Within a few hours, Angela is at the neurologist's office. He did a thorough neuro exam and he ordered an MRI of my brain. But even before the test results come back, Angela is sure what her escalating symptoms mean. As a nurse, I knew that's what would diagnose MS. MS, or multiple sclerosis, is an incurable disease in which the nerves of the central nervous system begin to degenerate. As the disease progresses, patients can lose their vision, mobility, and speech. Waiting for the results of the MRI was very nerve-wracking. I wanted to know, but yet I didn't. It was just, I can't even explain it. I was so scared, just waiting. For the last 11 months, 31-year-old Angela Smith has been afflicted with mysterious bouts of pain and paralysis. Now she's waiting for the results of an MRI, which she believes will confirm that she's developed multiple sclerosis. Just not knowing is just horrible. I just wanted to know what was wrong, what I could do, whether it was good or bad. I just wanted to know. It was several days later, you know, I got the results and, uh, my neurologist actually called me at home and told me that it was negative. I began to feel like maybe I'm just going crazy or something because it, 
they can't find anything wrong with me. He thought it would be a good idea for me to go see a neurologist who specialized in rare diseases. So he set up a referral for me to go see Dr. Pascuzzi. When I first met with Angela, she gave me a history, and that's really where the assessment starts. Angela has a past medical history of diabetes going back to a uh, young age. The second uh, step is then the examination, and it revealed some abnormal things, including tense, tight, and large muscles along the spine. And this produced an enhanced arch in the back. He felt my back, and he noticed that my lower back was like curving in. Watching people walk is uh, one of the hallmark activities that we, in a neurological exam, uh, like to observe. He had me walk across the floor in, in a straight line, like you were doing a sobriety test or something. I could not do it. I had no balance. Angela had very slow, mechanical, methodical uh, walk where the legs were almost like a robot's. Also, her reflexes, especially in the legs, were excessively jumpy, and the limbs would jump a little bit too much, and that's important because it's an indicator of a spinal cord problem. In fact, Dr. Pescuzzi now has a hunch about what's been causing Angela's strange symptoms all along, but he'll need to run a test to be sure. There is a blood test looking for an antibody that in the majority of patients who have this disorder have, in general, people that are healthy and normal do not have this uh, specific antibody in any measurable level. For the next 10 days, Angela and her family wait anxiously for the results. She needed to find out one way or another what was happening. Both of us were, you know, on pins and needles, and it was several days later when, you know, we got the results. Along with her examination and an antibody test that was sent off with the sky-high levels of the antibody in question, it allowed, with confidence, a diagnosis of stiff person syndrome to be made at that time. Stiff person syndrome is a rare autoimmune neurological disorder. In healthy individuals, antibodies attack infections and foreign substances in the body. But in patients like Angela, for some unknown reason, abnormal antibodies attack an essential enzyme in the brain and spinal cord that's responsible for controlling muscle activity. As the enzyme is broken down, the process triggers debilitating muscle spasms, back pain, and stiffness. What happens with this antibody is that it, uh, by attacking the enzyme glutamic acid decarboxylase, then leads to chaos in the brain and spinal cord. It's irritable, it's twitchy, and this produces the attack of sudden stiffness and tightness in the back muscles, leg muscles, sometimes arm and neck muscles. These patients can't relax their muscles even when they try to. A strange antibody is actually killing cells it's not supposed to in my central nervous system and that's what's causing the symptoms. If the spinal cord malfunctions, it leads the muscles chronically tensed up and tight, and at times they have vicious, incredible tightness or stiffness just because they're being bombarded with signals from nerves that come out of the spinal cord. And if your legs don't move at all, if they're like wooden planks, um, wooden planks just tip over. So patients can fall just because they have no motion left to compensate. A typical tight, vicious spasm might last from a couple of seconds to 10, 15, 20 minutes. It was very painful, too. I mean, just getting stuck time after time. If you can imagine having a total body cramp, it's possible to get a sense as to how miserable this can make patients. It uh, causes a ton of pain. It's uh, incapacitating. It causes uh, remarkable loss of function, even walking, getting your clothes on, going to work, caring for your family, uh, and uh, it's unpredictable. So it really cannot be trivialized or minimized. I was glad that they had found out what was wrong. Although Angela's back pain seemed to come out of nowhere, in fact, the doctor suspects it's related to her other autoimmune disease, type 1 diabetes. For unknown reasons, Patients with type 1 diabetes are more likely to get stiff person syndrome than healthy individuals. The antibody can be seen in patients with diabetes quite often. These same antibodies can be seen in people that have Angela's condition. They tend to be in very high levels. I don't think that diabetes itself produces or causes the condition that uh, she has, uh, but uh, it's an association. But while the origins of the condition remain a mystery, the attacks may not be as random as they seem. In fact, Dr. Pescuzzi believes there are very specific triggers. 
It may be the physical stress of work that um, produced uh, or triggered an attack. It could be the emotional or mental stress. Also, anything that startles the person can trigger a spasm or attack. So in a quiet, calm place, a patient could do much better. Because of Dr. Pascuzzi, I understood everything that was going on. I was very relieved and very happy. Still, Angela can't help but wonder why no other doctor could pinpoint the source of her symptoms. This condition is difficult to diagnose for several reasons. Uh, one is it's rare. And patients uh, who present with symptoms similar to Angela's, they would typically be evaluated for multiple sclerosis. And in this particular disorder, MRI, CT of the brain, they don't show anything abnormal typically. And I think it's because this is a disease that involves uh, chemical problems uh, that are occurring in the brain and spinal cord. While it's a lot for the family to digest, they're grateful that Angela finally has a solid diagnosis, especially when Dr. Pescuzzi describes the horrifying turn the disease can take. Some patients have uh, such intense stiffness and muscle spasm that they literally break bones. Some patients uh, have life-threatening symptoms because they can't move anything. They may not be able to breathe effectively, swallow effectively. I obviously wanted to know if it was terminal or if it was curable. <laughs> As of this point in time, there's no pill or procedure that leads to a true cure. Right now, the treatment is symptomatic. It's to make the symptoms less intrusive and less bothersome so one can have a more normal life. He said there was no cure, but it wasn't terminal. The treatment that I'm on now, I take muscle relaxants. I will have to take them for the rest of my life. They helped right away, and it just, it really changed everything for me. I was able to walk again. Angela needs to avoid, uh, number one, running out of medication. Wouldn't want her to do that. Number two, needs to have some limits on how much her system is startled and stressed. So abrupt noise, abrupt stimulation, excessive stress, excessive physical activity uh, ought to be limited uh, in a reasonable way. I think that'll help her long term along with her medication to keep this disease in check and under pretty good control. Today, although Angela is no longer able to work, she's living a very full life. After all this time, I realized that I could not have any more children because of all of the medication that I was on. We adopted a beautiful little baby girl from China and um, we named her Jamie and she was like you know just a perfect addition to our family and she's nine now almost ten and um, just a ball fire <laughs> she's she's so cute she's great the correct diagnosis really changed my life I'm happy now I'm really grateful to Dr. Pascuzzi he did know so much about all these rare diseases and could pick up on something as rare as what I have. You gotta keep pushing until you find an answer. Don't just mark it up to, I'm crazy. There's nothing wrong with me. Dr. Pascuzzi gave her her life back. He justified everything that was going on with her. I've had to learn over the years what my limitations are. And as long as I don't exceed those limitations, then I'm, I do pretty good.